Welcome everyone. If you're just signing in or if you're just joining the class, please sign into the chat. Um, you can put your questions in the Q&A for Kim Abelise, who's here to visit us today. I'm gonna just give it a second for more people to arrive. Let's see, um, and then I'll start with the introduction. Okay. Uh, Welcome, Kim. This is Kim Abelise. Kim Abelise is an artist whose artworks explore biography, geography, feminism, and the environment. Her work speaks to society, science, literacy, and civic engagement, creating projects with science and natural history museums, health departments, air pollution control agencies, national park service, and nonprofits. In 1987, she in innovated a method to create images from the smog in the air and smog collectors uh, the series brought her work to national and international attention. In 2019, she worked with the Garage Museum in, of Contemporary Art in Moscow to create smog portraits of world leaders with quotes, quotes from climate summits. National Endowments for the Arts uh, funded two of her recent projects, a, re a residency at the Institute of Forest Genetics, where she focused on resilience, and Valises for Campground, Arts Corrections, and Fire Management in the Santa Monica Mountains in collaboration with Camp 13, a group of female prison inmates who fight wildfires. She has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the J. Paul Getty Trust Fund for the Visual Arts, the California Community Foundation, and Pollock Krasner Foundation. Her work is in 40 public collections, including MOCA, LACMA, Berkeley Art Museum, Brooklyn Museum, and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Her process documents are archived at the Center for Art and the Environment. Uh, welcome, to Kim. Thank you so much for being here today. And just as a side note, your uh, smog series was the first uh, art exhibition I visited when I moved to Los Angeles in 1998 at Crossroads High School, which was very close to where I lived. And so I walked there. Um, and so it's a real honor to interview you today. I consider you to be a personal hero of mine, a heroine. Um, and so I'm honored to have you come and speak with us today. Oh, Mariana, thank you so much. That was a nice introduction too, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a, um, a PowerPoint and then a short video. And uh, let me go ahead and share the screen. Um, let's see, should be good. Uh, I think we're good, right? Mariana? You're good, We're, we can okay. see. Great, I just wanted to make sure on that. Um, so uh, I often start a slideshow uh, with this image. It's a video I took in Hanoi and it makes me realize the potential people have to flow very easily with one another. Uh, you can see that woman crossing the street is uh, really doing it with the flow of the oh, whole traffic and it's the sort of thing everybody's sort of naturally moving along like as if they're molecules or something. Um, I also because uh, we were going to talk uh, about community based work. Uh, I thought I would think about what was really the first time that I had done something that involved community and it, the thing with community involved in, uh, socially engaged work is there's many ways you can work with people and actually this is a very early piece from 1980 and I had asked people for all their used clothing and I made this garment which is called a yukata uh, it's sort of the early ancient version of a kimono and put it into this installation is sort of dry cleaner style. I guess for me, this is called slide gather and it's all these times we're always in lines with each other. And um, so this idea that I asked people for clothing and then very carefully reassembled um, the kind of the history of, of their garments uh, made me think, oh, I guess that was one of the first times I really realized how beautiful it was to bring strangers and friends and co-workers into a project. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the environmental work that I've done. Uh, a lot of the reason I did it was I had lived in southeastern Ohio before coming to LA for uh, graduate school. And 
I had a studio on Broadway downtown and I was always pretty horrified by the smog in the air and I would try to talk to people about it. And at that time, they would always tell me, um, oh, that's just fog rolling in, so don't worry about it. And um, I knew that's not what it was because my eyes were burning and my lungs hurt. And I had the studio on Broadway and one day I looked up the street and I saw the mountains of the San Gabriels, you can sort of see them um, wedged between the mount between the buildings in the background. And I had never really seen them before because of the smog. So I decided that I would photograph every day and see when I would see them clearly again. And it ended up taking a year and two months. So I built this bellows of a camera that housed all those hundreds of efforts of you know, photographing the mountain wedge again. I ended up painting the mountain wedge and you see it quite tall at the end of the bellows uh, because my memory of it, seeing it that first time was really so much stronger than any second time I was gonna be able to vision it again. And um, the deal with this piece was that um, on a first smog alert day, I walked from downtown Broadway from that same studio and I walked to the San Gabriels, but I, I went as the crow flies. So if I had to knock on people's doors and cut through their houses, I did. I went over and under freeways and over barbed wire fences and, uh, it was, uh, let's see, 16 and a half hours um, and, uh, and let's see, 10 and a half hours and 16 and a half miles is what that journey took. So the first smog collector that I made actually happened at that time period in 1987. And I hope you can see that that smog collector is actually the same shape as that wedge of mountain. And basically, I returned to the process when I moved to another studio uh, a little bit south of Los Angeles where factories were spewing out a lot of gnarly emissions, including formaldehyde. And I tried to fight through the city to have something happen. And I got pretty discouraged after a few years. So I revisited these smog collectors. So let me tell you how these are done. I make a stencil of an image and then I place them on different objects and sometimes dinner plates. And I set them out on my rooftop for varying lengths of time. And the smog is made out of heavy metals. It's made out of small bits of rubber that come off tires as they hit the road. It's made out of emissions from factories, depending on where you live. Uh, and also the oil product that comes out of car, cars and trucks, those emissions are really the, the biggest of the polluters. Um, so I've done different projects through the years. Uh, this is a dinner made out of smog uh, that is now put into three-dimensional uh, porcelain dinnerware. Um, I've done different large-scale projects with different agencies. The uh, California Bureau of Automotive Repair is actually an agency that uh, is in charge of our emissions testing when you get your smog checked for your cars. And I put these car muffler and catalytic converter sculptures with smog collector stencils throughout the city. And after they were finished, um, they were also sent around to uh, several hundred companies and corporations to try to encourage ride share. This one is actually located, look at, look everybody at Cal State Fullerton. So this was in your courtyard, you might recognize that. Um, along with this, um, you know, the Bureau actually let me just do this project. And once I was really working on it, I said, you know, we need to give information to people too. So uh, each one of the smog collector sculptures actually had this uh, information with it so that people not only knew how to get their emissions testing done, but what was really going on with these stencils and also to try to encourage again ride share because it 
early on like that, people really didn't want to do share a car with anybody. Now it's pretty commonplace. And now we're also working at home. So you can see how these really um, start changing the dialogue as time goes on too. So that small collector work was really my first time where I understood how much art could communicate to people in large groups, to children. Also uh, this idea that it was really connecting people one-on-one. -on -one. If you know the smog is something you don't necessarily want to talk about. So what the art really does in a lot of these projects, it really gives an entry into subjects that are typically difficult to uh, want to cope with. Um, I did all the presidents from McKinley to Bush, uh, and they had their quotes uh, about industry and the environment. These are six of them. There are 17 of them in the full set. And I left them out longer if their environmental records were bad. So uh, clearly I thought uh, Jimmy Carter really tried. You can see he's uh, out much less than Ronald Reagan to his right. Um, Jimmy Carter was out for four days and I left Ronald Reagan out for 40 days. Uh, more recently, I had an opportunity to work with the Garage Museum, Marianne, uh, Marianna mentioned that, uh, which is in Moscow, and I created World Leaders in Smog, and these are quotes that they uh, gave during uh, international climate summits. So. Uh, these are the these are all their aspirational goals or things they aren't doing, and the thing that happened with this project, whoops, is that um, you know I put a set of stencil plates out in Moscow. I put a couple sets out in Los Angeles, and because the research was so heavy on this, I decided to continue with it, and I located. Um, people in six different locations that were the that are the capital cities of these leaders and i had them placed in their capitals as well whoops sorry about that um, so actually this is the theresa may um, in london when it's still out on the rooftop uh, more recently um, in fact, during the bobcat fires that happened, you know, in the last month, uh, I lived part time in Pasadena, and you can see the sky in the in the distance. That's from the bobcat fires. So I really quickly pulled together some chunks of wood that somebody had given me. They were getting ready to throw them away, and uh, these are actually uh, the deck chairs from the Titanic. Um, I mentioned about this idea that, you know, art is so great about teaching and the part of the reason I've continued with these smog collectors is that they've really been a good teaching tools, like I said, for all age groups and also for environmental groups. I do a lot with science centers and natural history museums and really using these artworks as a discussion. Um, many, many workshops have been done through the years with, again, uh, all age groups and different um, classrooms so that the smog collectors are put either at the school to try to encourage uh, parents, for instance, not to idle their cars in front of the school and so, and so on. Um, another project with the environment, um, this is the runoff dolphin suitcase. It's made from all the beach trash that I collected that had gone through the uh, storm drain system following a rain. And this has been taken into a lot of schools. Right now it's owned by the Luxart Institute and they train people to take it around the San Diego area to uh, teach about the storm drain system, about littering. Uh, for me, a lot of these projects have to do about our enormous consumption that we're all guilty of. Uh, and all these talking points really come up. Um, I really arranged the 
objects that were found, all the trash, uh, so that you'd really be able to see the difference between these objects. So it wasn't just to be some colorful, great looking thing that was really uh, to allow discussion. Um, following that, um, I'm often asked to go. No, I hope the sound's off on that. Um, I got permission uh, from the principal at Harvard Westlake School if I could go in and collect their trash for five days. And uh, what I did was I collected it, I washed and ironed it. If you want to see me dealing with this, you can go on um, YouTube and Vimeo uh, to see it. But uh, basically what I then did was to divide up all that um, trash. And in this case, this is a figure made out of the paper trash from one of their days. So the scale is based on how much trash that was. Um, similarly, I collected in all their water that normally somebody would have come and collected this to recycle. I gave the person the, the recycling money and I had this uh, science and math classes calculate how much water had been thrown away. Um, again, this project and a lot of my projects uh, where their interest in schools, I, I really like to use these as a way for discussion. And um, the Science Center, maybe some of you have seen this. This is in their permanent collection uh, in their ecosystems wing. And uh, this is 45 feet by 48 feet. And as you can see on the text, uh, this is generated by the visitors on Earth Day. And this will give you a sense of the scale of it, as well as this. That's the hand for it. Um, now, I know um, Mariana told me that you have been reading about the Pearls of Wisdom uh, project. So I know that some of you know a bit about it. Um, this was with a group called A Window Between Worlds. Uh, Sandra Mueller was my um, person through A Window Between Worlds that communicated between myself, the, the agency, and also uh, dealing with uh, women and families and shelters and other groups that participated. So the idea was that uh, in the oyster, there's an irritant and the pearl really comes forth because it's protecting itself. And so from this idea, I asked each participant to bring a symbol of their abuser uh, and then what the idea was on Mylar paper to write their story and then from selections of yarn and threads uh, to encapsulate it. And the reason why I feel like this project was really successful was because it was really challenging to make this. Uh, basically, the project of making these pearls was something maybe you'd learn to do you know, the skills and the tools in a uh, maybe a beginning sculpture class or a 3D design class, foundations class. Um, and so the participants were all often having to help each other do it. Now, part of my reasoning was that I really feel these projects need to empower people and the idea also of telling the story is that uh, I know from my own history and experiences um, through childhood uh, that sometimes we become our story. And, and of course, any kind, anytime we go through trauma, it becomes a large part of what we are, but we also need to find a place to place that story. Uh, I'm, I'm not a big believer that people like just move on and these things are in the past, uh, but I do feel that it's important to figure out ways to integrate the story. Now, at, after the, everybody would make these pearls, then we would sit around and talk about a particular thing that they might tell their younger self or also 
what might they tell someone in a similar situation? So for me, the project really doesn't find its conclusion just with the completion of the pearl. It's also the interaction that takes place around it. And maybe some of you will have some questions or uh, comments so we could talk about this more specifically. But this, for instance, is from um, the Handbook for Living. And this is one of the quotes from the person that made this particular pearl. And this is actually one of my favorites. It's, it's got to be one of the simplest things someone wrote, but I think the whole um, metaphor about what that means to keep spare keys for yourself is very profound. So it's kind of this practical advice, but it also really has to do with um, keeping alert and knowing that we all ultimately also have to find a certain responsibility to ourselves. And especially the women that I, you know, interacted with through this, it was really like two years or more uh, through the project. Um, I really learned a lot from them. And, and I always really thought of these people that come out of domestic violence or sexual assault situations, you know, that they're coping with uh, as really, really very heroic. They're very athletic in sort of a physical sense of getting out of those situations, as well as this idea of being profoundly strong to, to be able to pull through that. You can see the way these are installed. They each are connected with a very uh, thin uh, ribbon. So the table that's in this piece has videos of the, of the clips that I just showed you of the process. So the videos are around the table and each element within this six foot diameter table uh, refer to one of the components and the materials. So you can see that ring uh, that's very shiny in the middle. That's, that's for instance, the mylar paper. And this is one of the way it was installed. These were just a selection of them. And as you saw from the first slide, there's, there are 800 of them in all. And the quotes on the right are uh, some of the quotes that you've seen and some others. Um, I wanted to show you this too. This was a graphic that I made related to the way artists work with community uh, components. Um, so that the pearl is in the middle as like the core of the idea and AWBW is the organization A Window Between Worlds and there's my name, Abelise. And then you see this, the uh, concentric circles of how this happens with workshops and funders and then also the public that uh, become part of the audience and maybe part of the participation if we did workshops with public. So um, I'm, I'm just gonna go through some of these slides a little more briefly, but um, I sometimes go into a location. Uh, for instance, this one was in Idaho in Sun Valley and uh, the community in talking with them, I really wanna know what they're interested in or what are the problems that maybe we could talk about. Uh, in Sun Valley, there are two different groups of people. There are uh, sort of conventional sheep herders that want to you know, move along the landscape with their sheep for grazing. And then there are people that uh, are from this environmentalist camp that really don't want to have the traditional uh, farming and so on happening in that place. And, and there, are, there is room for both of those groups, but it is really about that, um, that uh, kind of collision between the groups, which is what I wanted to talk about with all the work. Now, I'm just gonna show you this installation part of it. There were other elements and definitely other activities that I did with the community. But basically what I do with these video walls is uh, I make this wallpaper and then video monitors are embedded in the back so that parts of the insets are in motion. 
And this one really, for me, had to do a lot with, if you talk about the discussion about us in nature, it's, it's from when children are babies and small, we're always convincing them that nature is something outside of ourselves when that's not true. And also that nature is something that we want to observe in a more clean way. Like we want to go to a zoo and we don't want to get dirty. And, um, and so these funny ways that we from early childhood books tell a different story than what our relationship really would be with, with nature. Um, I work with uh, mental health departments as well as local uh, clinics and like health clinics. And um, the thing that I really do love about these kind of projects that I luck out <laughs> to have, um, it, this gave me an opportunity to be able to photograph kids with sample therapy. And I both did still shots as well as videotaping them. And some of you uh, with your background with art therapy uh, may be familiar with sample therapy. Uh, children that are uh, in going through trauma or uh, difficulties that are really causing great changes within their lives uh, sometimes can't articulate what's going on. So large trays of sand are brought in and the kids really start creating the narrative using the sand. So I photographed a number of children doing this and like you saw with that video wall from Sun Valley, all these videos ended up being placed within the, uh, the large artwork. So part of the installation was to make the video wall, uh, which is owned now by uh, the mental health department of Los Angeles County. And it's at Kedron right now, uh, which is a facility in South LA. Uh, but I also made a sample therapy uh, container so that during the opening, people could actually experiment with it and start to understand it. And this is the way the entire piece looks. Um, this actually has a video that runs through it that tells the history of uh, mental health through the United, the purview of the United States actually, uh, and was for the uh, anniversary of one of the Kennedys um, bringing forth changes to the mental health community. Um, sometimes I work with natural history museums. In this case, I asked the, uh, the people that run the different departments and the curators to select their favorite object in their collection. And this is actually a floor plan of the Natural History Museum downtown. So the, and their videos also of their back rooms and so on. Um, another one that I made, I won't show you this full video, but um, was with the Harn Museum in at the University of Florida a couple years ago. And on the outside of this large photo mural that I made are actually, they contain my collection of stuff. You know, all the different things from hikes or that people have given me. And so they seem three-dimensional, but they're actually flat on there. And I borrowed objects and specimen from the Natural History Museum. And so when you see a video adjacent and next to an object, the object is actually embedded and it's in formaldehyde or it's taxidermied. And on the right is actually video footage of the same specimen when it's in its environment. So it has for me a lot to do with these things, our, our desire to really collect and capture nature and to keep it as our own. Um, another organization I've worked with uh, and have quite a few times actually is Eco Arts Connection. 
Uh, this one had to do with lichen. Uh, lichen are used in laboratories to uh, find out about air pollution. Uh, basically, they collect lichen in different areas and then pulverize it and then do chemical analysis on it. So a lot of these projects, in this case, I did smog collectors with their local middle school. Uh, I created this lichen hunt so that you would uh, go on bus 206, which they were trying to uh, develop as a bus route. And with different hints, you could find the lichen if you went off on different stops of the bus route. Uh, this one was in the waiting facility uh, at the emissions testing. And this is the size of lichen. Some of you may have seen them if you've gone hiking. And so those photographs I took of the lichen ended up in a large video wall also. And it includes uh, the eyes of school children in the Boulder area, as well as their traffic, which is causing the pollution. Um, sometimes I do more graphic work. I'm not really a graphic designer, but um, People allow me to do these. This is actually an activity book for kids and families as they're waiting to see clients uh, at the THE clinic in South LA. And it's designed so that the adult has information about the same subject that the children are um, dealing with through puzzles or uh, coloring on the other side of the book. Uh, this one is in the UK. I photographed for four years and four seasons the main street of West Bromwich. Uh, it's kind of like uh, parts of our country that used to be uh, very vibrant with the auto industry and now are really having uh, times, difficult times struggling. Um, I wanted to bring this one up in part because a lot of times when I'm working with the projects, the people that are part of the project, in this case are the shop owners or maybe somebody that lives in one of the buildings. So through those years, I got to know a lot of these people. And then when it was exhibited back in the area, then suddenly the audience and the participants all are intermingled. And I think that's a common thing and thread that runs through the work when I uh, do the socially engaged work. Um, I think the last of the slides on this presentation, um, some of you may have seen this before. Uh, the whole project is called Walk a Mile in My Shoes. Uh, someone had put this photograph on a church website and had said they had gone to Atlanta, Georgia and saw the shoes of the civil rights marchers. And I just couldn't let it go. I was so fascinated by this. And um, I did some research and found out that this collection belonged to the woman you see in the orange. Her name's Zernona Clayton. And what the reason she had it, she uh, was very close to Martin Luther King and, and did a lot of the uh, work when they were organizing marches and so on, and had the uh, insight to start saving these shoes and asking people for them. And she would use the soles of the shoes and they would, you can see on the right there, they uh, would etch them in granite. And this walk of fame is very close to the King Center in Atlanta and also uh, one of the National Park Service centers. So these are some of the photographs that I took. Um, my husband, Ken Marchiono is a photographer and I hired him to go with me to Atlanta. And I didn't care if there were only like six shoes or something, I was gonna photograph them all. And uh, there were about 60 pairs of shoes in all. And the final piece is a permanent piece that's on Obama Boulevard. Uh, this one's at the corner of Obama Boulevard and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And these are photo tiles of these shoes and also I made a bronze repl replica of Martin Luther King's shoes. 
and there are different quotes from him and biographies on each of the people that are represented by those shoes. Um, I purchased this photograph to put in the piece. I thought it was a beautiful photograph of Dr. King. It's really such a personal moment where he's taking off his shoes to uh, go into Gandhi's shrine. And I just loved it. You see the shadows of the photographers that are, you know, there so you can see that he's being watched, but it's such a beautiful, tender moment. And I, I just put this in here because occasionally I go and clean up these pieces uh, and just, I don't know, one time I even hired a, uh, a, a water cleaner, you know, uh, to sandblast water on it to clean it up and get it back into shape. I didn't tell the city actually, I just did it. Um, and on the other end, a mile from that piece and I'll, a mile west at Jefferson and Obama. Uh, these are shoes of the civil right, of, excuse me, of local activists and local leaders. And this is, again is a replica of the shoe that um, Martin Luther King used to wear when he was marching. So these are his marching shoes. And there's that beautiful photograph of them in, in Selma. Um, I hire poets sometimes. Uh, Beverly LaFontaine uh, did the poetry for this site. And in order to read the poem, you need two people. And you can see the way that poem is done so that someone needs to sit on one side of the poem and the other, and together you can read it. And, the, and there are four of these benches with different parts of the poem uh, throughout the that location. And I wanted to put this photo in. Um, that's Herb Wesson, actually, who is the council, council person uh, for District 10. And, um, and a lot of the family members of these people I represented came to the reception, which was really lovely. And for any of the heroes that were no longer living, I actually had the families either loan me the shoes or from photographs we uh, selected the shoes and I located uh, at prop houses um, shoes if, if the people were from like the early 1900s. So um, I'm, I'm next going to show you a sh short video, um, but I'll introduce it by showing you this symbol. This is the symbol of Camp 13. I worked for six months with incarcerated women who are trained as firefighters. Uh, it's up in the Santa Monica Mountains. There are other conservation camps throughout California. And actually the um, firefighters are not firefighting right now because of uh, uh, the pandemic, but that's kind of an unusual situation. And in fact, the, um, the state really does rely on them to do the firefighting. And when they weren't able to do it this past couple of months, it was really more difficult. Uh, Gavin Newsom has just signed uh, in, into law that the people that are, have, you know, like I was working with, um, once they get out, they can apply to get their felonies reversed and then they can apply to be firefighters. Because the problem up to this point has been that because they had felonies, uh, there were certain parts of applying to be a firefighter that require that you didn't have any kind of um, legal problem behind you. And so now that'll be different. And I'm, I'm just, that was the best news I, that they came up with in the last couple months. So I made this video so that you could really see the project we did. Um, so 10 valises were made from the ground up and the purpose of them is that the uh, park service rangers and educators from LA County Fire use them as teaching tools to teach about fire prevention, fire abatement, and also firefighting. So this really is 
a continuation of that storm drain dolphin suitcase that I showed you. Uh, I know that when sculpture becomes a more hands-on idea that the viewer that is uh, looking at them, they can touch them, they can take apart, you know, elements of them. Uh, there's a better chance for them to really start learning about the issues that are involved with this. Uh, because of climate change and the climate crisis, the idea of how serious these fires have become uh, has really amped up just in the last couple years. Uh, and the thing is, when we were working on this, uh, the, there were fires, I think it was up in Yosemite area, uh, and some of the women, you know, they take them on buses and they take them to these different locations. They're not always like fighting fires locally. And I was pretty discouraged because I thought, oh my God, you know, this whole project, is this going to be of any use? And, and then I realized and remembered what the women at Camp 13 explained to me that 97% of the fires are caused by humans. So really education is critical in the idea of having people realize that um, kind of like the storm drain system also, part of the problem is we, we never really explain to people about things like infrastructure or their relationships um, when they live, especially near forests. Um, so how this worked was I went up to Camp 13 and I, you know, I had worked with community groups quite a bit, but I went up there the first day and I was thinking, oh, everybody's going to be so excited that we're going to work on this project. And I quickly realized that the women that were up there that would be more inclined to work on projects like this with me, they were already making their own stuff. They, they're, Rain sticks are really big up there because when they're clearing the land, um, they find a lot of those yucca plants and then they bring them back and they make the rain sticks and they paint them and so on. And a lot of the uh, women would buy these kits from a craft company that's approved by the, um, you know, by the prison system and they would make gifts for their friends or their children and so on. So I realized that the best strategy was that I would go up there and I would bring the materials to maybe start doing one of the valises, but I would bring additional materials so that if I, you know, they wanted to see how you mix plaster or plaster gauze or I would bring paints or wire uh, that they could use the supplies and I would teach them how to use the tools and that we would work side by side. So what happened was very organically, we all started working together. So if people wanted to work with me on elements, they could, and if they wanted to just you know, work side by side and uh, make use of the materials, they could do that too. Um, you may have remembered one of the valises that I showed earlier in this little video had crochet on it. Maybe you would have thought it was knitting, but it looked like a sweater, the green interior where there's a little house tucked in there. And um, I wanted to mention that one because um, one of the women was crocheting and I, I said, oh my God, I've tried to crochet so many years and I never can do it. So would you teach me how to crochet? And that started with everybody crocheting. So I brought up miles of yarn and it was great because I think a lot of times in workshop situations with groups, it's really important to keep trying to level the playing field. It wasn't like I came in with all the skill sets and now everybody had to follow me. This was really about understanding that we all have skills to teach. We all have life experiences to share and and that that was a constant through this whole six months of working together. 
So in the end, in that particular piece, uh, I suppose I work with about 80 women in the end, maybe more. Um, everybody did at least one line of crochet. And because it became a landscape, uh, if they were skilled, it was great. And if they were unskilled, it, it was also worked out just fine. Um, the other thing, I guess, I, I'm going to end here with the video. Um, the other thing, I guess, that crosses my mind is the idea that all the information in the valise was, uh, let's see, I think I can stop share now. There we go. Well, oh, where am I? <laughs> um, all the information was done by me taking notes with what they said. And the reason I want to mention this is because uh, some of these situations working with groups, and in that case, you know, because, you know, we're, the incarceration is a real particular um, environment, I was not allowed to take up a camera, I wasn't allowed to take any recording equipment. And Ironically, that's kind of the first thing artists think to do, right? Let me get the picture of this and let me get you, you know, with your hands doing that. And so the, so at first I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is like, I'm missing like two big tools, right? Photography and audio. And honestly, it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I had to be a hundred percent there. I had to look more clearly, listen more intently. I was taking notes when the women would tell me information that we should put in the police or where I got the information wrong and we'd clarify it the next week. And it really made for an attentive interaction. And I, I can imagine you might all be able to understand why that would have gone that way. Sometimes behind a camera, let's face it, we're like distancing. That's part of the beauty of photography, you know, that distance. So I think I did it. Thank you so much. I have a lot of questions to read uh, to you from the students. Um, I can't so hear you yet, Mariana. Uh oh. Oh. Hear me now? Uh, let's see. I can't. Oh, maybe it's me. <laughs> I was thinking, yay. Okay, good. I was like, you can read the questions, but I can read them to you. Also. Oh, yeah, that'd be better. Okay, awesome. Don't... Um, yeah, I, I, I've seen the valises in person. I've seen the, a lot of your work in person, and it's so powerful, I think, in its uh, carefulness and, and I, the way you're describing listening to uh, participants as being really a, a gift, you know, that, that there's a, a gift that comes with having some things shut off and some other senses. Uh, turned on is really, I think it's a really beautiful uh, thought to, to start with. Um, well, here's a really great question. Uh, this is Tori Cantu. Uh, I'm planning on teaching art to high school students. If I want to incorporate art therapy into my lessons, what is one way I can propose art therapy as a beneficial uh, tool to parents and administration? Is this, is this the idea about trying to convince them? Is that the question? Yeah, I think it's like advocacy. Like how do you advocate for therapy in high school, for art therapy in high school. Wow. You know, there's a part of me that thinks, okay, I, I respond gut level, all right, and I'll eventually maybe get to a better answer, but my gut thing is um, maybe it's not called that. <laughs> I, I, because I, I don't know, there's a part of me that thinks, um, you know, maybe you just know you're doing that and you incorporate it in with the lesson as a, because I, and maybe you all can respond more to this than I can. It just makes me wonder if um, there's kind of a trigger that happens, right? Like, oh my God, you think I need therapy? I don't know. Is there something, Mariana, maybe you need yeah, to- Yeah, well, it's interesting because- that. A bunch of teachers at Hoover High School, which is the school where I used to teach before I taught at Fullerton, they're doing Wellness Wednesdays, um, but they were calling it that and they had to change, they changed the name. And I think it was because the students, even though they enjoy 
doing the um, meditative therapy, talking, you know, going through those processes of really, um, you know, uh, meditation to uh, reduce trauma and stress, they weren't responding to the names. So they changed it to Weird Wednesdays. <laughs> And weird Wednesdays they lay like, uh, which I thought was really brilliant of the teachers to, to respond uh, to how the students were feeling vulnerable about even labeling their trauma, you know, like, or even labeling it as therapy, even if they need it, you know, it's just the idea that if it's weird, it's okay. It's like you can suspend your judgment for a day. Um, yeah, because I think we all get so, um, we get, there's so many labels placed on us all the time, right? For whatever reason. And um, so maybe we're all a little bit sensitized to that. And uh, yeah, I think I just want to add one more thing. Like um, not even, I'm not even thinking so much about maybe works that I've shown you, but when, when I'm doing any of my artworks, there are always these multiple layers that I'm thinking of that I probably wouldn't even mention, but they really change the course of the way I direct the work or the workshops, for instance. So um, I, I always think of them as like, I always have these ulterior motives, which sounds so sinister, but they're always good ulterior motives. Um, for instance, years ago when say women weren't noted, especially as, in certain fields, right? I would always have female examples within the work. Well, I didn't tell people that. I just made it seem natural that this would be part of it. So that's what I mean by an ulterior motive. So I think it's definitely worthy, especially uh, with the way students are, that you would have things that are um, art therapy uh, related in there but i think it probably just works just fine if you know that and you've just taken the beauty of it without having to uh restrict what that sounds like or feels like agreed i would say that it's allison stewart that calls it weird wednesday i don't know that all the teachers at hoover do but um she's just like you said very much paying attention to what the students are saying and what they need and how they're feeling. And so she adjusts very quickly in order to make it uh, a more relaxed space. But a lot of it is too, is she, you're right. It's, it's not triggering unwanted or unneeded attention and just moving through that space and allowing it to be what it is and keep, keep investigating. This is another question from uh, Kelly Dow. Uh, where do you find most of your inspiration and what do you do when you feel like you're stuck? Oh, I like that because we all get stuck for sure. Um, you know, most of my inspiration comes, and I think this is kind of a typical answer, but uh, just from what's bugging me right now, you know, like, like something that just, I'd like to not think about it, but it just keeps going at the top of my head. So uh I, to add to that, I think that uh, you could, let's see, how would I say this? You could develop uh, an annoyance about something. And I'm thinking of the example of the storm drain dolphin. Uh, I got that grant and and I realized, God, I don't even like going to the ocean. I just... You know, so here I'm doing this project that's very ocean related, right? Like that, I, I'm one of those people that gets, I just will go more on the shore. I don't want to get tousled in the wave. And, and uh, but I, but what happened was I, I read and read and read about dolphins as mammals, as mammals, they're more related to humans than I think any other mammal. So if they get illnesses in the ocean from the ocean trash, we would too. You know, like any tumors they would get, we would too. So I guess my point is that though I often respond to the things that are really like, I, I keep using the word bugging me, but are really like eating away at me or things I realize I haven't dealt with, 
you, I, I know that by reading and research and thinking, thinking on a topic, you could really have that connection and develop that. You know, it doesn't always have to be about what my problem is, you know, that I can get that, um, you know, empathy is used so much right now. And I, I, I still like the word empathic, you know, you can develop that with people. And that's where you make these connections. Um, the other thing I only wanted to add, because there was a second part to that, right? The second part is when you're not inspired, did I hear that right? Something like that, when you need inspiration. You know what I do? I always have done this. I go out on the street and I do some art thing out there. I go, so in other words, I go out of the comfort of my little, you know, space and I go out on the street and it is so unnerving <laughs> that it, it's like getting a shot in the arm. It, it just, you know, to put yourself in discomfort, it has to be the best thing anybody can do to just jump, jump into that cold water. That's great advice. We've been talking about how in art classes, you need to foster an environment where kids feel safe so that they're okay with ambiguity or mm -hmm. anyone who's an art, an artist lives for the, we live for the ambiguity. Most people don't. <laughs> and, and so it's hard to encourage people to go into that creative space, but that's a great, it is a source of great inspiration though, to be willing to go into those ambiguous spaces. Mm -hmm. This is a, a great question. Um, it, she gets to it, but she says a lot of nice things about you too. This is Jasmine Flores. I just wanted to say that I'm a big fan of your work. I especially enjoyed looking at over your collaborative project that you've called Belize Number One Fireline. The piece is so beautiful and really sends out an important message. My question is what inspired you to do this particular collaborative project? Um, on that one, that was actually the, that they are numbered by the you know order we, we made them. And that was because early on when I went up to Camp 13, um, they told me about there's the green and the black areas and the fire line between. And those fire lines, uh, some of them are made before fires, you know, like they're really like safety spots where so the fire can't leap to the other side. And, uh, and then of course, during a fire, they're like crazy trying to dig these things, right? Because otherwise the fire just keeps streaming over. And to me, that whole visual of, you know, this path we make to try to protect, it was really powerful. So, you know, all the women really got involved in, in making all those, those are laser cut model trees that we had to assemble and, and got into that one. So thanks a lot for that that question. And of course, they're all very detailed too, right? So when you see them, I always wanted them, and the women were into this, because like I say, they were pretty much making crafts up there. So their whole like love of the same stuff I like to do, like stitching and, you know, like I said, crochet and um, kind of learning these new crafts was, uh, was really exciting for all of us, I think. Well, they're definitely research projects because they're so elaborate and they unfold and then they unfold and then they unfold and they operate at all these different levels. Um, it's beautiful work. Um, and this is a, I'm going to combine two students' questions because they're related. Um, Noemi's is, what artwork or environmental piece are you most proud of? And then Megan High's uh, question is, which piece was the hardest to make and why? So I see those as being, you know, uh, what you're most proud of and then which one was the most complex and difficult, kind of related. Oh yeah, sure, and it and it actually relates to to what you were saying about um, encouraging students to uh, know that it's you, you're not going to always get the right answer. Like you have to be a little lo lost when you're making art projects. You said it more articulately, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, like my motto on my website it is uh, <laughs> some. That is dear to my heart. I say that I like to, you know, make art in the dark with a faulty flashlight, right? So my, my answer is really my favorite is when the failures just keep tumbling forward. You know, because I, I 
I am always a little bit disappointed with what I make in the end. You know, it, it never, it's not that I expected something, but for me, it's the process is everything. And if I'm not in, if I'm not really like 100% invested in the process effort, then it doesn't matter the outcome. I mean, to me, the outcome just happened to be there. It, it's all that sort of trying something that didn't work and, you know, um, but, the, but the one about most proud of, I don't know, you know what, it's always just the one I'm working on. So I guess that is why those relate because it's when I'm in the middle of kind of all that problem solving and effort that comes and maybe doesn't work and maybe, wow, look what happened there. You know, um, that's why with the, like the public artwork, as much as I can, I try to fabricate as much as I can of it. Like some stuff I'm not allowed to do because I'm maybe not certified for it or something. But to me, um, you know, you can have a design of something you want or sort of an, an image, you know, maybe if you're one of those creative people that has inspired thoughts, you know, you sort of get a little bit of a vision there that you should quickly write down. <laughs> and, um, but then it's that process along the way where for me, materials are always talking to me and they're trying to tell me something and if I'm really like tuned into the process the tools the materials I'm trying to maneuver all those come together and that's really where wow it really makes you believe in art you know yeah I, it, that's a that's a good way to 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 think about it it's almost a little bit greater than the sum of its parts um yeah uh this is from Roland Castaneda uh, do you have any tips for involving the community in projects? Are there any environmental issues that you haven't created projects for or that you would like to? Uh, well, and those are kind of two twin questions too. I think um, involving community takes, I'm always scared when I do it. I don't care if somebody funded it, that's like a whole different issue, but then you get to the community Right. And I'm always, did I say scared? I think I meant terrified. <laughs> and, um, and to me though, if, if I get like that, then I pull together all my bravery that I have all that. And I'm saying it this way because I think it is hard to, to work with community. Look like some communities are yours you know, maybe it's my next door neighbor, or maybe I'm in some group and I've, you know, got a relationship or Mariana, you have your group of hysteric curators, you know, like that's a group that you have um, already a connection with. But the, the, I think the challenge is that when you go into a community or try to develop a community, because you could make a community, right? You don't have to just drive up to a community. Um, I think that the biggest thing that's got to start happening is like a trust level. Like they, they often talk, uh, you know, not just me, like anybody that works with community that you don't want to go in and say, hey, this is your problem. Let's help it. You know, I, I know how to help it. That's like, the app. you do just the opposite of that. You go in and you're curious, like, well, what's the issue here? You know, like, is there something we could use art for to really do something tangible that you have, you know, what's the thing that's bugging you, I guess is the thing, right? So I do think it takes a lot of courage because I think mostly we live in a world that, is pretty suspicious of everything, right? Like suspicious of strangers and people. And I think to just be alert and aware to that um, goes a long way just to kind of understand that, that you're just a facilitator, I think, or a conduit, you know, just, I'm not the leader coming in and you're down here and I'm up here. I'm always actually, trying to go down here and make them up there, I think is, is a big thing. That's such a beautiful description of like co uh, teach or, you know, seeing this, the student as a co learner with you or in, or the community is co learning that you're learning from each other, that it's, 
there's reciprocity. It's not um, directed by you. Instead, it's it's imagined in that space together. Um, and I, I'd like to end on, I know we're getting close to the end. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, but you uh, were a professor at CSUN for many, many years. And I know that you have, um, in that spirit, really collaborated with a lot of fascinating artists. Um, are there uh, any particular memories that stand out to you from teaching? Or was there an artist that you worked with as a young artist that you've watched their career grow? Can you tell us a little bit about um, I guess your teaching practice as a professor for many years and just uh, do you have a, a story about that to share with us? Yeah, I think it's not so much about a person. Um, I, well, I will say one person that really championed me up there was Joe Lewis, who is at UC Irvine now. And uh, I say championed because, you know, at the time I was, I, I had a public art program up there, but I ran it you know, people were doing like more traditional public art projects, but we did a lot of community-based work, like social engagement was really a big thing. And the, and again, the reason I say about needing somebody, Joe was the uh, chairperson when I got hired, was that, you know, this is sort of out of the box kind of teaching, you know, and uh, talk about needing kind of trust and faith between students and faculty and the department and then the community, uh, you know, participants that we would work with. Uh, it, it really took faith that he was willing to give me. And so that always gave me that extra courage that I always needed. But um, the, the one thing that I remember, well, as soon as you said that, it popped into my head. Actually, even a particular photograph of this young man. Uh, we went into this halfway house that first year I was there. And, you know, when you teach, sometimes you're pulling these classes along with things they don't know where you're going to take them, right? And, uh, and I was always like, come on, here we go. You know, we're going to do this. And we went into this halfway house. Uh, where these the youth was there and we did a few projects there and I taught them how to use a drill and so my students were learning when these like teenagers were learning too and I don't know if now you'd be allowed to take a drill and saws and stuff into these places everybody's so litigious now right which is another topic but um uh that we made these things, they were really hard to make. I mean, we were like building stuff in this halfway house and changing their backyard and all this stuff. And one day I did bring a camera and they said I, in this case, I could take their photo. And I took these portraits of these, this, these youths holding one of the pieces they made. And I really realized then that a lot of young people that are in these, you know, very difficult situations, these transitional housing situations, they just want somebody to take their picture. I mean, honestly, I, I just, I get real emotional even thinking about it. Even the roughest of the kids that were there, I saw them that day I brought back these beautiful portraits, you know, the next week I, I brought them back. I, I saw the way they took them back to their rooms. And I just, I, I guess it's a beautiful place to close because I think we underestimate how the smallest interaction that some of us just have naturally uh, because of, you know, our si lucky situations are things that a lot of people don't get. And the smallest gesture can go miles for someone. You know, it's just, it's stunning. Um, so I'm glad all the work you all are doing, you, Mariana. It, it's really important work. Thank you so much for ending with that beautiful story. Um, it's very moving. Um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you today. And uh, I'm just so honored that you came to, to visit my class. And my students are so lucky to, to listen to you today. And I'm, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you.